So, um, you know, uh, welcome everybody. This is um, a very sort of impromptu and last minute um, thing that we've put together here, but we're really, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to hear from uh, Dr. Tim Seelig today. Um, and this is the sort of discussion that I think we should be doing more of in CBCS. And so, you know, I've been talking with um, Daniel and, and Kate about this. And so we're hopefully that this will end up, Tim, being the inaugural policy chat on relevant public policy matters that CBCS might uh, get involved with. So, yeah, we've, we've put this one together a bit quickly, so it had to be a Zoom, maybe in person. We'll actually be sitting around in a room having these discussions. And one of the things that I'd really love to see happen out of those discussions is to um, time them around topical issues that CBCS can contribute to, perhaps through making submissions to, you know, inquiries or, you know, consultations, such as the one that we're going to talk about today um, on the future of conservation of the Lake Air Basin in Queensland. Um, so, um, to before we kick off, just want to, for anyone who hasn't met Tim, you should. I have been um, lucky enough to sort of collaborate with Tim on and off for, you um, 10 or 12 years now. Um, and that was from back in when Tim was working for the Wilderness Society. So the, I always drag Tim in to talk to my conservation policy class because he's got experience from all different sides um, of these issues. Um, his background, he has a PhD in urban sociology and decades of experience in a range of different public policy areas in terms of advice and advocacy in government and in non-government roles, um, and as well as an academic and a policy researcher. So really the perfect person to sort of lead these sorts of discussions. But of course, today, he's talking to us in his role as the director of um, strategic policy in the Department of Environment and Science with a government hat on and there's um, uh, a, a, a formal consultation, a series of consultations around this issue that's been going on. So we'll get um, a, a very slightly tailored version of that. And then hopefully some advice on what we can do to input to that process as CBCS. So I'll hand over to you, Tim, and thanks again. Great. Thank you, Martine. Hopefully everyone can see me and hear me. I'll share some slides in a moment, um, but can I first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm joining this meeting from today, the Yagger and Turbul people. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and I'd like to note that sovereignty was never ceded on these lands. Other people may be joining this meeting from other um, uh, traditional country. Please feel free to acknowledge that in the chat line, and if there are any First Nations people in, in this meeting, um, I'd like to welcome you too. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to share um, slides that are part of a standard presentation. Um, so as Martin said, this is a, uh, a formal consultation exercise. Um, so it's probably slightly constrained um, compared with the potential for future policy discussions that uh, your group might, might have over time. Um, so this is a very standardized presentation and I'll just walk you through what the consultation regulatory impact statement that's been released for the Queensland Lake Air Basin um, says, and in particular, what the key options are. Now, I'm just mindful that some of you will be familiar with uh, what a consultation regulatory impact statement or a RIS um, involves, but for those who aren't, this is one way that government formalizes its consultation and engagement with the community. Um, it, it's a document that's, um, lays out the rationale and the issues connected to a particular um, issue, in this case, the protection of the rivers of the Queensland Lake Air Basin region. Um, and it includes a series of options about different aspects of what government may choose to do. Government hasn't yet made any decision about what it's doing. It's That's another part of the process. It'll be through a decision RIS. Um, so this is a key consultation step. It follows uh, eight months of work with a series of stakeholders um, uh, that formed a formal stakeholder advisory group that included um, industry bodies, local government representative, conservation groups, uh, three traditional owner representatives, um, scientists, and, and a number of other um, key interested groups. So it's the culmination of a, a long process. In fact, um, the Palaszczuk government made a commitment in 2015 to protect these rivers. So this has been a commitment made in three um, successive elections. And we're at the pointy end now of gathering final feedback and positions um, to take back to cabinet. So consultation closes next Friday at 5 p.m. sharp. Um, 
Uh, and I'll come at the end to uh, indicate how you can respond, but you can make submissions, uh, you can uh, complete an online survey, um, uh, or you could um, send us an email. There are lots of different ways. But the main things um, to think about is uh, how might you um, want to express your preferences for particular um, uh, options that are in the consultation res. All right. If there's any questions about the process, um, just put your hand up and I'll I'll seek to answer them. So just for those who are not familiar with the area we're talking about, um, it's previously been referred to by other names, um, Channel Country, Western Rivers. We're using the Queensland Lake Air Basin as the main descriptor. It's part of the broader uh, Lake Air Basin um, system. Um, but the Queensland side of it is about 30% of, of the state. Um, and it's in the west and, um, and northwest of, of Queensland. It's um, very special. Uh, it has three major river systems, the Georgina, Diamantina, and Thompson Baku Cooper uh, systems that all feed into Caddy Tanda Lake Air, which is in South Australia, but our three major river systems are the, the key feeds into, um, into Caddy Tanda and all of the um, uh, Ramsar wetlands and um, and other um, very special ecological and cultural um, places that are, um, that are connected to the river systems. So we're talking about protection of the river systems. Um, now, some hydrologists might argue that you have to start an entire uh, hydrological basins. Just to clarify, we're not doing that this time. You may have seen previous maps under previous protection regimes, such as wild rivers, that mapped the whole of the basins. This time around, we're not doing that. But there is a key question on where do we map um, as being the most sensitive ecological and cultural um, parts of those systems. So all of this has come up really over questions of how best to protect the rivers um, and from what. Currently, there are prohibitions in areas called the designated precincts, which uh, prohibit um, open cut mining, in-stream dams, and uh, large-scale irrigated agriculture. And that's been to respond to previous threats over decades of large-scale um, irrigated cotton, of concerns about mining and concerns about dam building. So this time round, the major focus from lots of lengthy discussions with stakeholders has really focused in on the issues of unconventional oil and gas. And in particular, unconventional oil and gas and all of the associated processes that go with that, and particularly um, intensive fracking um, on the floodplains and in the main water courses. So at the moment, the current regulatory system is silent on oil and gas. Um, but also, um, from all of the analysis that we have conducted, we don't believe there is production scale unconventional oil and gas on any of the floodplains, and it's mostly the Cooper. Um, uh, at this stage. And so this is a very important point in time where government has the option of acting proactively, should it choose to do that, to provide greater regulation around um, unconventional oil and gas. So um, I'll walk you through um, the, the key questions that are in, in the RIS, unless there's any particular questions just about the process. You have to put your hand up or get someone to flag that. Okay. Not seeing anything. So the first, um, and, and that's just where we're talking about. If you're not familiar um, and you want more detail, then let me know. By the way, if you want shape files for um, all of the spatial options I'm about to walk you through, just yell out. I can email them to you immediately after this presentation. Um, and you can load them up in your preferred um, GIS tool. We do also have an online um, browser version of ArcGIS that will um, let you walk through um, the same level, but it won't let you overlay um, other um, spatial layers of resources or, or whatever else. All right, so let's get to the spatial options. Um, so the traditional approach in a consult in a RIS is to um, include several options, one of which always starts with do nothing. So spatial option one is essentially retain the existing designated precinct area. I won't get into the intricacies of strategic environment area and designated precinct, because in the case of the Queensland Lake Air Basin rivers, they're the same boundary. Um, there are other um, river systems in other parts of Queensland that have different SEA and DP boundaries. In this particular area, they're the same. So option one 
is this. Um, and to say this is a, a screen capture, so it's not in great detail, and, and we're looking at a th more than a third of Queensland, so you really do need to um, uh, have a look at the um, mapping tool online or, or get the shape files. But essentially, we've we have a designated precinct that maps some of the main watercourses of the Cooper, Diamond, Tima, uh, and Georgina systems. It maps the main aggregated floodplain areas. Um, but as I'll show you in a moment, the current designated precincts exclude some of the upper tributaries and streams that, that also are key watercourses in these systems and doesn't take a, a total uh, genius to understand the importance of the upper parts of a river system if you're looking at protecting the entire system. But anyway, that is the current designated precinct for the three systems we're talking about, and that forms spatial option one. So option one is leave the boundaries as they are. Option two um, maps the main um, floodplains and watercourses that were in option one, but it adds in um, some upper streams and tributaries. Um, it also adds in some additional um, floodplain management, uh, floodplain areas and the Diamantina and the Georgina. It doesn't add to floodplain areas in the Cooper, but it does pick up on some of these upper streams and tributaries. Um, so option two mimics as far as possible what was previously mapped as the most ecologically sensitive areas under the previous Wild River regime. So it includes the high preservation areas and the special floodplain management areas that were mapped under um, that regime. So the main changes are in the upper systems and some additional um, floodplain management areas. And spatial option three picks up on some other areas that were mapped through scientific analysis um, over uh, uh, the decades that fed into the Wild River um, work, but they didn't receive the highest level of protection under Wild Rivers. But for completeness, we've developed a third spatial option, which adds in some of these other floodplain management areas. They're not always necessarily um, the areas that will capture the main overland flow, but, but um, as uh, the wetlands team have shown me, um, every flow is different. Um, so for completeness, we've included this as, an, as a third spatial option. It picks up on all of the previous areas I've shown you and adds in a number of, of other parts of the floodplains on the three systems and some broader or, and wider areas up in the upper systems as well. As I say, you're not really getting the high level of detail here, so I would encourage you to um, have a look um, either through your own GIS systems um, with the shapefiles or with our online mapping tool um, to zoom right in and add the layers on and off to see what um, see where we're talking about. But that's the first part of the consultation, Riz. So it discusses a whole range of current activities um, and, and, um, uh, and sort of walks you through, um, you know, why uh, mapping the right parts of the rivers is important, but these are the three options that are in the RIS, and they are the three options that we're initially looking for feedback on. Um, so they're offered in the RIS without um, any indication of preference at this stage. Government hasn't decided what, what its preferred option is, but our work at the end of the consultation process will be to analyse all the RIS feedback and responses and brief um, back to Cabinet both on what the community has said, but also any further uh, advice we offer them on which approach might be the best one. Any questions about the spatial options? Uh, Tim, yep. can I just jump in and ask, the, the, the South Australian portion of this, is that, that is National Park, right? Um, so this is the Queensland side of the, of the Lake Air Basin that we're focused on. Obviously, the mm. Queensland government has a jurisdictional limitation and it can only refer to what occurs in this state. Queensland is part of an intergovernmental agreement process that involves the Northern Territory, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, and the federal government. Um, but at this stage, we're just focused on what happens in Queensland. Caddy Tander itself is in Lake Air, and obviously what occurs when the rivers flow over the borders, and in fact, indeed, in the case of the Georgina, where um, parts of the watercourse flow over the border into Northern Territory and back into Queensland, and some of the headwaters are in the Northern Territory, I think from an absolute comprehensive river protection perspective, 
we would want this discussion in Queensland to generate further discussion with those other jurisdictions about what occurs over the border. But at this stage, Queensland can only look at what's in within its jurisdictional power. Yeah, but, but it's useful for us to understand the context um, where this sits related to other protected areas and what's going on with the connected parts of the system over the border. And I wonder whether that's shown um, uh, not in, in this map, not in this map, but if you get the shape files, you can overlay protected areas. Um, I mean, you've got um, Mungathuri yeah. um, National Park over here, the Strasleki um, deserts, you've got Kunji Lakes and Ramsar wetlands in South Australia. Um, so there are lots of different parts of protected areas and, and you know, world recognised um, ecologically sensitive areas. Um, but what occurs within those areas at the moment, obviously, is purview of the South Australian government. Um, the intergovernmental agreement that brings all those jurisdictions together has been very much focused on water resource planning. It's barely talked about oil and gas. Uh, it is increasingly now starting to focus on the, the role that First Nations traditional custodians should be playing in, in future processes. But um, our experience is that the intergovernmental agreement has not engaged on the oil and gas issue today. Uh, Daniel, you had a question too, I think. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wondered you if there was any context you could provide as to the re rationale for the difference between the 2014 sort of geographic area and the current one. So in 2011, the Queensland, the then Queensland government um, uh, enacted, sorry, it already had the Wild Rivers Act in place. It um, declared these three river systems as a part of wild river systems. There was a wild river declaration for the Cooper and then one for the Georgina and Diamantina together. And they used um, spatial option two as the, the, the highest sensitive mapped areas as the basis for protections. Um, the government changed in 2012. Um, and the then Newman government um, repealed the Wild Rivers Act and rescinded the Wild River declarations in 2014 and replaced them with uh, the current designated precinct regime based under the Regional Planning Interests Act. Um, so that that legislation is still in existence and is still the, the, the main tool for which the rivers are mapped under. That's where the statutory map sits. Um, so the proposition of whether to retain the existing mapped areas as option one, to go back to essentially what was mapped as the most sensitive areas in spatial option two, or to go beyond that and adopt a, a broader set of areas as option three is what's being consulted on at the moment. Thanks. All right, um, mindful of time. So I might move to the regulatory options in the consultation is so the spatial concern is obviously about where but there's an obvious connected question about what what are we talking about occurring within the mapped areas whether it's the current mapped area or any new mapped area so just a reminder the current um, regulatory regime and this is an addition to petroleum legislation and mineral resources legislation and the environmental protection act but under the regional planning uh, interest legislation um, there are prohibitions on open cut mining, dams and large scale irrigated agriculture within the designated precincts. So the core question that the stakeholder advisory process took us to was what about oil and gas? That was a repeated concern that was raised by a, a whole variety of stakeholders um, and became the kind of focus of uh, discussion on the basis of risk. Um, there are lots of activities that occur in this region, grazing, tourism, a lot of town-based activities and so on. The question became, what is the biggest risk or threat to the e ecology and the cultural values in these river systems now or into the future? And the gas industry in particular has been really uh, talking up the prospects of unconventional uh, gas um, in this region. Uh, and all of our analysis points to the significantly different and highly industrialized methodology that's applied to the extraction of unconventional gas. 
So if you want more information, please read the RIS. But in summary, conventional extraction is largely tapping into gas reservoirs that are a few hundred metres to, to close to a kilometre deep. You're drilling a hole into the reservoir. It's released under pressure. Um, and it's methane, the same as other unconventional gases, but it is pretty much a fairly straightforward process of drilling a hole, letting it come out and piping it away. Unconventional shale, tight gas, deep coal gas. Um, there's no calcium gas really down in the lower coopers. There are some parts in the upper. Um, that's much deeper, three to four kilometers down. You would definitely need to drill very deeply through parts of the Great Artesian Basin. Um, you'd need to get down and probably drill horizontally to get into the, um, the sedimentary seams. You would have to intensively frack them to crack the rock open to release the methane. And that process involves a huge amount of water in and back out, the use of um, fracking materials and chemicals, uh, and and big surface sort of footprint issues around the storage of water in, water out, chemicals, and so on. So the footprint of conventional versus unconventional is, is chalk and cheese um, in terms of size um, and also impact on surface um, disturbance and potentially overland flow. Plus, of course, the use of chemicals and the storage of water that's come back out, which often has many trace minerals in it, um, including uranium, is was regarded as a, a sort of elevated risk to the ecology of the rivers and the cultural values there. So reg option one is leave the system at the moment as it is, basically silent on oil and gas. Um, regulatory option two uh, seeks to provide greater certainty to industry in its endeavours if it wishes to pursue unconventional gas by basically saying fracking would be an, a predetermined acceptable use. So all of the things that go along with needing to frack wouldn't be an automatic barrier to, um, sorry, to whether um, you would get approval. So that's to provide certainty industry. Option three uh, goes the other way and says, we need to provide certainty to the ecology of the rivers essentially. And so there'd be a prohibition on future unconventional oil and gas within the mapped areas. So not across the whole of the Queensland Lake Air Basin, but within those mapped areas. Option three requires government essentially to kind of nail the distinction between unconventional and conventional. Um, but there are many definitional um, devices that the Geosciences in Australia and CSIRO have developed. And there's also a whole series of indicators of what we would use to assess high impact activities. They're all detailed in the consultation RIS. Um, and essentially, we're confident we could find ways of clearly distinguishing between conventional and unconventional. Industry talks a lot about, yeah, but we frack already. They stimulate some conventional wells. We've seen no evidence of production scale uh, unconventional in the Queensland Cooper Basin. Um, so it's not there yet. Option four. Reg option four essentially says no future oil and gas uh, in the mapped areas, whether it's conventional or unconventional. That's administratively much easier. We don't need to distinguish between the two types of resources being extracted and their methodologies. Um, but it does involve us basically saying there'd be no future conventional gas on the floodplains. And there is conventional um, uh, extraction on the floodplains at the moment. Um, some of it's been there for decades. It's very low intensity, um, but it does have some potential impact on overland flow. But overall, the stakeholder advisory group process led us to the point of saying it has not posed a substantial risk to the ecology of the, the rivers in a way that unconventional probably would do. So option three is just focus on unconventional and option four is, is focused on any conventional or unconventional. Again, all of this is just within the mapped um, areas. So again, government hasn't made a decision yet. It's seeking community feedback and responses on which way to go. Any questions on those considerations? All right, I'll keep moving on. There as a third set of options. Um, uh, it's only two options really um, and this is probably something that would get the river ecologists a little bit more excited. Um, but there's a concept of, of articulating the environmental attributes of the river systems, which is designed to answer questions like, what is it you're seeking to protect? And what is it that you regard as being special 
both from the point of view of what it would be is or would be prohibited under um, in the mapped areas, but also more generally when there are development assessments going on under other legislation and also under the regional planning uh, interest legislation. So essentially, what is it that um, government's really sort of recognising as being important environmental attributes? Again, this op these options go back to a bit of that question that Daniel was asking about, you know, um, the, the historic development. So under Wild Rivers, all six of these points here, um, the, what's included in option one and option two, were all articulated as key environmental attributes of the of the areas that were mapped in the um, under the legislation. And essentially, these are the ecological processes and and hydrological processes that are considered of greatest importance within the the mapped areas of of high protection. But when the government changed and the legislation changed in 2012 and the legislation changed in 2014, only the first three of these uh, environmental attributes was adopted. And so currently, option one indicates what the current situation is, and that's just these three attributes, the natural hydrological processes, the natural water qualities and the streams and the beneficial flooding um, that comes. Whereas the previous regime included these three additional um, ecological uh, environmental attributes and so option two is to put these three um, uh, parts back into the overall definition of environmental attributes again government hasn't made a decision about um, which way to go on these but they are the two options retain just the first three um, or option two is um, add back in what was previously also I articulated in terms of environmental attributes um, as option two. Okay, still not seeing any questions, so I'm going to continue. Um, one key part of the consultation RIS, um, and these are not expressed as options, but these are expressed as proposed responses from Queensland Government, um, concerns delivering on the priorities and aspirations have been articulated by the First Nations people of the region. Um, and that's been through a number of highly consultative and uh, participatory processes that have led to formal statements and positions presented to government over the last two or three years and previously through um, um, particular statements and um, declarations. And so as part of this process, we were um, very keen to uh, ensure that we'd properly heard and understood what those priorities and aspirations were um, and to articulate them back out in the consultation RIS and develop a set of proposed responses. Um, so as I say, these are not presented as options to pick and choose. These were articulated for the First Nations people themselves to review and provide us um, feedback on, which they are doing. Um, but in the interest of transparency, um, we wanted to um, include them in the consultation RIS um, so that everyone is aware of, of the issues that are being raised. Primarily, they are um, concerning three key um, uh, elements. One is improved and better recognition of country. Anyone that's familiar with, say, the native title um, regime hopefully would understand that that's a, a limited approach to recognising First Nations country. Um, there are many hurdles um, and requirements to get to native title and many First Nations people are not able to to achieve that. Um, it's an important part of the process, but it's not um, it's not comprehensive, and nor is cultural heritage mapping um, in under the Queensland Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act. Um, that act's actually under review, but we wanted to acknowledge that there have been more recent processes, such as Section 28 of the Human Rights Act, and uh, a number of um, elements that will feed into the past to treaty process that the Queensland Government has, which require us to have a much more detailed, nuanced and culturally informed understanding of, of country and and why, what matters and, and what cultural heritage, tangible and intangible, is all about. So there's a there's a commitment there to for government to work um, closely with the First Nations people of the region to to improve our understanding of country, that will lead to the second element, which is improved um, engagement and participation in decision making. And the third element is about recognising that there are many um, existing and many, many future um, 
uh, First Nations owned and managed enterprise opportunities. Um, as I was mentioning to Jen, I, I went to one in the north of the region uh, last week. It's a multi-million dollar, very high tech and very cutting edge um, piece of uh, First Nations led enterprise. UQ is actually a partner in, in many elements of that, but um, it's a very exciting and very impressive. So and it's just one example of the many opportunities that, um, that exist. Um, but sometimes, as you know, you need seed funding, you need um, endorsement and support, and you need, um, um, you know, practical partnerships to kick these things off. So, so there's a commitment to try and um, try and um, further support that. So we're looking forward to hearing back from the Traditional Owners Alliance and all the other First Nations people um, from the region that we uh, hopefully we'll hear from, and then we will propose back to cabinet um, what we think the Queensland government should be committing to. But that, that's the flavour of that. The last key element um, uh, is just to flag that you may have heard um, discussions about critical new economy minerals, um, the sorts of things that are, are going to be required for um, uh, further renewable energy rollout, the electrification processes, electric vehicles, um, transmission, battery storage, and all sorts of things. It's an emerging area of interest to, to government. Um, and there is an overlap of, of regions between an area called the Northwest Minerals Province um, and the Queensland Lake Air Basin. Most of the Northwest Minerals Province actually sits outside the, um, the LEB boundary, but, um, but a significant part of it um, does sit within it. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to, as much as possible, have our cake and eat it. We can try and map the rivers, um, try and extend the protections of the rivers, whilst also acknowledging that there's going to be an inevitable um, growth in seeking to extract critical new economy minerals. As it turns out, um, the areas that we're talking about don't seem to extend significantly into the sort of areas where those resources are believed to be. There's an awful lot of mapping of potential of resources. Um, it's an ongoing matter um, for the geologists to find exactly where they are. But most of the resources actually also involve underground mining rather than open cut. So on the basis of all the analysis we've been able to do to date, we're pretty confident that we're talking about a very minimal um, impact on that sector. That's not to say there may not be other environmental considerations um, and the Mineral Resources Act and the Environmental Protection Act will still, of course, apply and all the usual assessment and approval processes will be will be used but in terms of whether there's anything significant coming out of um, our work here at this stage we're pretty confident there isn't there are some exploration areas that potentially overlap with some of the spatial areas and we're needing to do some further analysis of what that means in practice but exploration areas don't necessarily end all end up being uh, production areas in fact most of Queensland is covered by exploration areas um, but not much of it uh, necessarily gets to production stage. So we, we were uh, um, we we wanted to have a good look at that, and that's the position that we've landed on. Um, again, we're not really sort of seeking to further regulate a mineral mining. Um, the prohibition on open cut mining would be extended by default if the spatial area gets expanded. But essentially, this element of the regulation would be silent um, on. Uh, underground mining or areas away from the, the river systems. So in a whirlwind nutshell, that are the, they're the key parts of the consultation RIS. Um, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at it, if you go to the desqld.gov.au slash LEB consultation, that will jump you to our landing page for a number of elements of the consultation um, process and the background to where this work has come from. You'll also notice there's um, some more recent scientific reports, including one from Claire Cote from the Sustainable Minerals Institute at UQ, who we contracted to do a synthesis analysis of a number of the recent gas and environmental um, reports that were kicking around. I think it's a really good report and it um, uh, kind of really nicely summarizes a lot of the key issues. Um, so go to that side if you want further information. As I say, if you want <clears throat> shapefiles, just let me know or, or maybe um, uh, uh, Martine or someone um, and um, someone can forward on the requests. 
Um, there is a formal survey that we've developed um, to allow ease of response to the options. You are required to register for it, and that's just to ensure we're not being spammed by robotic responses. Um, but we don't see any identifying information with the responses we receive. We get them an aggregated response. Uh, comments we will see as text form. We won't be able to connect any individual identifier information from, from registration uh, in the response. So it's anonymous as far as it can be. Similarly, if you want to send um, submission in or you want to provide comment in any other way, you can email policy initiatives at des.qld.gov.au. We will need to be satisfied that you are a unique and human sender, but beyond that, we won't attach any identifying information to any, any response. We just need to satisfy ourselves not being spammed. Um, it is highly preferable that we get submissions that actually get down to which spatial, regulatory and environmental attribute option is preferred. If we get a submission that says we want much bigger areas of the rivers protected and we want less gas, we will note those comments, but that is less helpful in getting back to cabinet, given that cabinet has approved the consultation rears, and so it's approved the framework um, that's that's being used. And in fact, every government agency and um, minister um, was part of that conversation. So it, it it was a long time coming, but it meant we got to a point where we'd kind of really focused down the core options. That's not to say we won't take very seriously any other um, comments or suggestions about approaches, but um, it may be a little harder to feed into the the formal advice back to cabinet in, in terms of the options that are being floated. Um, otherwise, we've got one week, two hours and 20 minutes to get um, responses in. So it's a 5 p.m. sharp. That's just so that there's still a person around in case something goes wrong with the lodgement system, which has happened overnight in the past. And so we've made it 5 p.m. next Friday. Um, as I said, it's not about recommended options at this point, but government will be making decisions which could range from not doing anything at all um, or, or, or not deciding to, to even kind of consider it further right the way through to um, picking particular spatial regulatory and other options. And then, um, then we'll need to work on the implementation side of it. Um, and the responses to First Nations um, priorities and aspirations is, is um, a central part of this, um, and we're hoping that will be some clear statements from government about um, about its intended directions, which uh, I believe very much support the path to treaty um, exercise. So that's about it in terms of content um, and um, and the core parts of the RIS. Happy to stop and um, hand over to any questions or um, or comments or or feedback or uh, anything else that people might want to. Have a look at. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. So any questions for Tim? Maybe while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, is there a way, Tim, we can get a copy of the survey questions or, or prompts offline so that we can decide whether that would be a, a good thing to use or yeah. You know. Uh the options that are in the survey are the options that are in the RIS. So if you go to the executive summary, the end of page two or three, you'll see what the, the core options are. And essentially it is a tick this box or tick that box. There's a little bit more, there's a little bit more of a descriptor for each of the the, the questions and the options, but basically it's a, it's a make it easy for people to indicate what their prefer preferences are. Okay, so it's not really a place for um, to provide justification and explanation of choices or any nuance around that. It's just this is my vote. Uh, well, there are yeah, so simplified uh, means of voting or expressing preferences. There are text boxes that allow for additional information, and if if you want to justify um, your preferences or make comments on any aspect of that, then certainly will that is part of the survey. But people aren't required to fill that in to, to provide their responses. Yeah. Okay. So as um, you know, an organization, well, a, a group of experts um, who may want to make um, some comments or connect the decisions, the 
the you know the the preferences for particular options to broader you know international policy processes or something like that to give weight to what's being put forward perhaps a a free format option might be more effective okay sorry you're breaking up a little bit there was that a comment or a question yes sorry i am um, well i don't know correct me if it is an <laughs> incorrect comment <laughs> Can you repeat it though? Because you broke up a little sorry, bit. Sorry, it's, um, yeah, and sorry, because I, I also dropped out completely halfway through. So <laughs> at the end of my question before, so apologies for that. And I was just wondering, I mean, I'm sort of thinking how um, CBCS might respond to a thing like this. So there's, I usually see um, submissions as being either from the perspective, you know, of a, an affected citizen versus having some form of, you know, academic expertise on a topic and being able to use that to feed into a process. And that latter group, I suppose, is if CBCS were to contribute a, um, a submission, um, they would, we would probably want to be able to um, point to the sorts of international commitments that Australia's recently signed on to and so on um, as being a justification for one of the options that we might put forward. So it sounds to me like those are the situations where you're better off doing a free format submission rather than just the survey. Yeah, look, I think you can do it either way. It's however, comf however most comfortable you are. Um, obviously, I've rushed through a number of elements of, of the context and the the implications of protecting these river systems um, in in better ways or stronger ways. I mean, one of which is the incredible bird life and habitats that we're talking about. Um, these aren't, I mean, these are very special river systems in terms of the nature of them. These are unlike Southern Australian rivers, they are, you know, very large scale overland flow based systems. Um, I'm not a geologist, but as I understand it, they're quite um, geologically distinct in terms of what happens on the surface and then what happens below. So there's almost no recharge from these river systems into the GAB, Great Artesian Basin. There are some springs um, that form um, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems and, and so on, um, obviously from um, water from the GAB, but, but uh, th they're quite different systems. They are very much influenced by um, monsoonal um, and cyclonic rainfalls in the upper catchments um, and they form the most amazing and spectacular um, flow systems if you've ever flown any over any part of these um, rivers you know there's really nowhere else that you kind of see this in such an intact way and in, in a healthy um, healthy ecosystem so there's lots of things that that flow from that you know there's incredible bird life there's other um, obviously uh, species that are very dependent on these systems, there's a lot of First Nations traditional activities and cultural heritage that's connected to them too. Um, and that's just in Queensland. Um, so I think there are potentially many angles um, um, that you, you can take, but the core focus has really been on, um, it's, it's not just about why should we protect these river systems, but I suppose we're sort of trying to get to the pointy end of how and, and over what yeah. threats. And I think I saw a comment from Hugh earlier about um, they're all going to be marine ecosystems later. Um, interesting, they all have been marine ecosystems, actually, I think, um, geologically over um, a very long uh, extended period. So um, that would be taking parts of these systems back to um, to where they have been. But yes, it's a, it's a very ancient landscape. Um, and um, yeah, you know, uh, there's been decades of articulation as to why um, these areas should be protected and um, there's ongoing discussions about the whole of um, system um, approaches and um, you know there's been historic talk about world heritage listing and so on so it's um yeah it's a uh, I think there are a number of different angles that you potentially could take in in deciding how and, and what form of submission might take so just um sorry jumping in uh, I just opened up the survey and started doing the survey to see what I would it would look like and just to go um, along with sort of what Martine was saying this is it's definitely set for sort of an individual not an organization so I'm thinking maybe one thing for this type of response for CBCS might be that there are places for comments or suggestions and we 
you know, after internal discussions might have some information that we would want to provide as sort of example text for people if they were interested in doing their own individual submissions. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And, um, and I suspect that uh, other groups and sectors that are providing um, sectoral or organisational um, comments will, will make them via the submission process. As, as I said, the main thing in that in that regard, though, is uh, as far as possible, if you wish to, um, try and focus in on the options that are provided in the same way the survey does. Th that's partly just to um, to ensure we haven't we don't lose the value of a, of responses um, that are kind of generic and supportive of a particular a broad approach, but then kind of get lost a little bit in the the definitive government decision making process that we will inevitably end up in. Government has to make a decision about the spatial bits, the regulatory bits, and the environmental attribute bits. And um, if it gets a million different options, it, that still you know still end up so it has to end up somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Hi, Trudy. Sorry, I hadn't realised you were online, but um, good to see you. No worries, Tim. Good to see you again, mate. I have one quick question because I haven't sort of gone into it a lot further since we last met. Um, the I'm looking at my map, <laughs> the Lake Basin and the um, Branty Tenures with spatial options. The Northwest West Minerals Province is, well, it partially involves the Diamond Tina and Georgina as it is anyway. Um, I'd have concerns just on that um, because if no one else is aware, I'm, I'm Mythica person and I'm also, um, these three river systems come across our country, so it's pretty specific to us. Um, just wondering about the regulations on that moving forward as well, being north of us. Yeah. yeah. So towards the back end of the consultation, Riz, there are, um, there's a couple of maps that overlay um, will indicate where the Northwest Minerals Province is generally regarded. It's one of these areas that's talked about as if it's truly definitive, but um, mm -hmm. when we went looking, um, we actually had to review a few different um, um, areas that were apparently in the Northwest Minerals Province before we landed on what we regard as the official one. Yeah. There is an overlap. Um, so much of that area is north of um, north of Camerwell and outside of the LEB area and into the Manizer and up into the Gulf area. But yeah, there are parts that come into the upper Georgina and Diamantina systems too. Um, as far as we can tell, whilst there's lots of exploration, um, there's limited production going on at the moment. And as yeah. with the unconventional resources in the Cooper Basin, including you know near Windora and, and south, there's at the moment quite a lot of talk. There's We've included confidence um, level heat mapping that Geosciences Australia and CSIRO, CSIRO have conducted, but they are all still potential resources. Mm. They're not proven uh, as being there in that in that sense, um, and the quantities unknown and the questions of how commercially viable and technically possible it is to get them out, um, even if you wanted to and if government was prepared to to allow it. Is still a big open question. So you yeah. hear a lot of kind of prospective talk, um, uh, but yeah. Yeah, the same I think occurs with the, with some of the mineral critical minerals. Um, mm. But certainly th there is some potential for for overlap. But as far as we can tell, um, they're mostly underground resources, and um, uh, it would they're not extending naive. directly into the floodplains, though. However, so. But, well, so um, yeah. yeah, we'd have we'd have to we'd have to try and make sure that there wasn't um, mm. uh, that sort of overlap. Um, we did acknowledge that in some case, you know, there may be cases where the coordinator general needs to be involved in a process to to manage um, those issues. But at this stage, we're not seeing the kind of overlap that um, that we thought might be the case. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no worries. Thank you. Next trip. I have one more very quick question, just out of curiosity. The, the survey is obviously it's set up for choosing between the options and it also has comments. And I I guess I'm 
I'm curious from the government's perspective, are they just, or is this uh, not obviously a, a democratic vote, but are you, are you essentially looking for the numbers of people that are choosing the options and, and weighing that? And to what degree do, are the comments actually uh, going to impact or weight? Um, well, look, so in terms of the numbers, it, it fundamentally, it, it won't come down to the numbers in, in a crude kind of first past the post type system right. but i think government would be um, will be mindful of w what levels of support exist for which options um, I, I think in terms of it being a community consultation um, uh, informed process then um, i think government would um, would want to know you know what the response is said but in the end i think government will make the decisions that it feels is the best from a whole of whole of region basis and it'll be mindful of all sorts of other considerations which um, Martine's heard me um, bang on about in successive lectures of what uh, factors get taken into account in government decision making so we don't live we don't have a process of pure um, unadulterated evidence-based policy making um, there are you know it's evidence informed um, and evidence in the form of scientific uh, input and um and uh, you know industry analysis and so on definitely part of the mix community sentiment and community preferences are clearly part of you know the, the broad base of input and, and um and, and evidence that's considered too um and there will be other factors um yeah it, it's just standard part of government decision making and um yeah, we have to wait and see um so there's no it's not just a matter of if it was 99% in one direction, that's definitely the way it's going to go. Um, that would clearly be material to to the considerations of government in the final analysis. But yeah, it's um, in terms of the comments, um, that's an interesting question. Um, have, having been a social researcher, including a qualitative researcher, I, I, I'm aware of some of the social um, research tools that we could use, like in vivo, to to do quite intense. Um, sort of analysis of the commentary, uh, as well as um, using them to to simply kind of back in the reasons why people might have chosen preferred options and so on. Um, we just need to see what volume of commentary we get and, and how detailed it is, I think, before we make that call. But the comments will definitely be taken into consideration. Um, how many we get will depend on, on, on how big a challenge that is logistically to do. Um, uh, and I actually haven't looked at how many survey responses we've received to date yet. Um, so, um, yeah, but they definitely won't be wasted. They'll all be taken into consideration. They'll all have you know, a certain amount of weight. Um, but in the end, it's a cabinet decision. Um, cabinets make decisions on the basis of lots of different inputs.